uh, Kelly, who is the founder and CEO of Visual Plan Security and Facility Management. We have Mr. Michael Warren, he's with AECOM, who is, and is the Director of Digital Practice and Technology. We've also got Mr. Ross Dalton, also with AECOM, and he's America's BIM Director. And Kelly, let me go ahead and send this on over to you. I'll make the chat go away. Great, thanks for the introduction, Kim. And I, I really appreciate having the opportunity to speak to those in the Building Code community and honored to be speaking with my co-panelists from AECOM, who's one of our most important customers and is involved in some really interesting projects, especially in the Vegas area. Um, they're one of the biggest and uh, definitely have some very talented people on the team here joining us today. Myself, I have about 10 years background in geospatial, work with a um, couple of the largest uh, LiDAR companies. And I currently own a software company that does reality capture. Uh, which we're going to talk about today. And uh, one of the many tools that AECOM uses on their projects. And one note is that I will be in Las Vegas, unfortunately not this week, but I will be July 19th through the 21st if anyone wants to meet up in person. I'll be attending the ISC West Security Conference. So um, feel free to ping me after the event if there's any interest. Um, so getting started, you know, we've got a couple um, three different sections we're going to go through. First will be on virtual inspection, which I'll talk through. Um, Michael will um, tackle the code enforcement side. And then on the construction management side, Russ is going to speak to some points there. And there are some terms we're going to use today, and I'm not going to define everything up front. What we'd rather do is show you some case examples of what we mean. But I know this term digital twin is used and it's being used more and more frequently. And I, I do think that it's important to define this term as we start. And, and a digital twin is, is a replica, a carbon copy, and it could be a physical structure. It can also be non-living things, IOT devices, processes people. And the whole purpose of digital twins is for us to be able to more efficiently and quickly simulate, understand, visualize things before we put them into place. And this allows us to save on rework, have better critical thinking, collaboration, and bit better results at the end of the day. But we will tackle some of these other terms through the presentation. And feel free to put uh, your questions into the chat window and we'll answer them as we, as we can. So when we turn, took a, take a look at reality capture in general, we're looking at all visual technologies that are used for building documentation and through the design and through the inspection process. And, and, and doing activities like uh, code enforcement and, and construction management. And what are we trying to resolve here? We're trying to reduce the amount of back and forth and exchange to sites, reducing site visits, reducing the health and safety risks that come with going on site, the training and, uh, and, and regulations that also go with that with certain industries. And to have that, that simulated uh, virtual digital twin that we can reference virtually from our iPad or phone remotely 24 hours a day. And that gives us that ability to revisit at any time in the future. So talking about some applications, uh, we did a project, one of our first big projects was with the Gaylord Hotel and Convention Center in Florida, just outside of Walt Disney World. 65 acre um, piece of land, uh, millions of square feet of both hotel space, uh, restaurants and exhibit centers. And we had a team of five people go out and scan everything right down to the washrooms. And it was a, it was a big task, but the value proposition was massive. You know, things that we can uncover, even on the rooftop of the top of this atrium, where we have full visualization to see things like broken pipes or safety risks and these types of things. Another interesting example uh, was a recent project we did with a security consultant, Butchko Inc., where the UMC Universal Medical Center in Las Vegas was scanned. It was about a million square feet, multiple buildings. And the process was, uh, was, was, we didn't scan every detail there. It was more focused on where cameras, access control, certain things were going to be located. And what we saw is, is a reduction of the need to go back. So we had four budgeted trips that knocked down to just one and a number of opportunities to save on rework and really just better collaboration and understanding of what we're trying to do and when we're trying to do it. A lot of concerns with COVID and, and being act, getting access to those facilities during that time too, last summer. 
So what is behind the door, above the ceiling, below, below the floor? You know, without having a good tool to be able to capture and visualize, it's really hard to understand and to be able to um, locate things accurately. So another project we're working on with a sensor company is to be able to locate some of their gateway sensors, uh, which are located above drop ceilings. And I think if nobody really likes taking these ceiling tiles out. I can tell you I had to, I had to remove uh, personally about 30 or 40 of these on the first floor just to locate uh, five gateway locations. And that's very time consuming. And, and really does that need to happen if we know exactly which tile to pull out? Likewise, we used a 360 Rover to document at two feet because some of the locations that we were capturing were under workstations. And I'll show that in a second. So the process is to walk through with a hard hat and a camera or a tripod or Rover or drone and to be able to take photographs at walking speed and to process that into measurable digital twins or reality capture. Now, there are some applications where this makes sense when things are visual and they don't need a high degree of accuracy. What Michael and, and Russ are gonna talk about a little bit further are, are technologies like LIDAR and, and SLAM where you know, a high degree of accuracy is critical for the success of the project, as opposed to here, where we're really just trying to generally locate and understand where things are located. So another project that we worked in the oil and gas industry with our partner QI2 um, is with the tank integrity inspection uh, space. So you know a lot of regulations just getting inside of these tanks and then to be able to mark them up and to just understand what needs to be repaired and where, where it needs to be repaired. So things like the uh, painted markings on the left side, you can see that those patches have been completed. You can see that an entire floating roof structure has been installed um, as part of the finalization of this process. So now, uh, you know, a, a company like Marathon doesn't have to leave uh, Ohio to fly out to be on site to inspect the process and have that project oversight. They can have data, in this case, same day. Photo capture was 90 minutes uploading to the server 20 minutes. And within the same day, they're inside those tanks virtually. So where they're using the, the processes in the pre-documentation uh, of existing conditions and through the cleaning process, then doing the formal inspection and marking up the issues that are not to code, and then starting to look at uh, you know, who's going to repair this, who's going to bid on it, and, and then looking at that quoting. So multiple vendors can not have, not have to be on site. We have all these safety challenges and OSHA training that has to happen to have vendors on site really just to provide quotes. We can eliminate a lot of that. And after repairs are completed, we can properly document those repairs so that we know before filling back up those tanks that things are done properly. And then into that post inspection process before we look at uh, exterior recodings and things like this on a more frequent basis. We got a case study on our website that you can read a little bit more about that if you're interested. Another project we're working with some local municipalities up in the Vancouver, Canada area are those um, organizations that don't have an active BIM program and maybe not have the funding to do so and have a lot of facilities that have very little documentation and very inaccurate documentation. So a cost-effective way to go through and create visualization and an understanding of where things are located. And now we're starting to tag assets and add asset attributes. So basic things, make, model, serial number. Um, and, and then the service provider can also gain access to that information. And what we're trying to remove is the trucks rolling back and forth, the data, data silos that happen, and, and the fact that we're wasting time uh, where we don't necessarily need to if we have a digital twin. Um, on the same project, we are doing some construction monitoring where we're doing a capture uh, on a weekly basis so that we can understand where the project's at. This really helps from a construction project management basis. So we can, you know, before we send in the next contractor, know for a fact the site is ready for that contractor. Also to be able to, to visually um, find issues, uh, to be able to document RFIs, to be able to understand things more clearly, and to be able to address issues before rework happens, or to do the rework before it becomes a much bigger problem. And in that note, I'm really proud and happy to uh, present Michael, uh, who's going to start the next part of the presentation from AECOM. And uh, go ahead and take away, Michael. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much, Kelly. It's great to be here. Uh, 
As stated, I'm Michael Warren. I'm the Director of Digital Practice and Technology. What does that mean? Uh, Kelly described it, uh, some components or parts of what we do, but we're a team of architects, historic preservationists, engineers, and professional licensed surveyors that basically provide the capture and modeling, the, those digital twins of the real world uh, for all of our design teams worldwide across AECOM. Um, it, it starts with you know, generalized field survey information, but goes all the way up to manned aerial flights. So the services that we provide are listed there, but what I really wanna focus on as you read that list is the capabilities of the technology that Kelly describes. In the upper right-hand corner, Kelly had mentioned SLAM. Uh, SLAM technology is great. That is a handheld LIDAR scanning device. And what you see in the other two photographs are two different types of what are called terrestrial LIDAR scanners. The great thing about this technology is, um, you know, Kelly was showing the 360 photographs and imagery, and I will speak to that in a moment. But that is really the starting point of capture. We use that type of technology prior to going out to the site, mobilizing with this type of equipment for the safety of our contractors and our personnel uh, to make sure that we can visualize everything that is there, but also put it into scope so that we capture the right information, get the right vantage points, the right perspectives on how we're collecting all of that data to um, take that to the next level, which is with the devices that you see in those images there. But the laser scan to BIM covers all aspects of the built environment. We also do drone work for very large civil sites, water treatment plants, uh, things that are massive or sometimes very tall buildings. Uh, there are limitations with UAS or drone. Um, and we're not talking about the kind of drones you see at parties. We're talking about drones the size of cars. And as we go bigger and bigger into these things, we go to helicopters and then manned aerial flights with planes, um, based on topographic maps, property surveys, sensors, um, site logistics, mobilization for very, very large scale projects. What do we do with that in the end? We turn over BIM models, you'll see some examples. Russ will speak to that as well, as far as the, the building life cycle and, and how reality capture plays into that future. So with this next slide, what you're looking at is what you might be used to if you've looked at properties on site. And what I mean is if you go to the real estate agencies, they'll often give you these 360 views of a house, their 360 view house tours. And that's great. It's great to visualize the property. We use it again for our purposes, for safety and pre-planning and pre-preparation. But the reason why I brought up a house is we're talking about code enforcement. And Part of my previous life, I was a code enforcement officer as a lead building official outside of the city of Pittsburgh. And it would have been great had I had this capability and technology, whether I was doing property maintenance or construction additions or even new home constructions. Uh, digital photography was just at its infancy, very expensive and very small um, capture media that we could put the imagery on. These devices can handle gigabytes worth of information. They're readily available through a Wi-Fi or by linking to your phone uh, to connect to your cellular network and record this, put it back on a server, but the most ideal place to put it is the cloud. So what's important about this kind of reality? Uh, that reality capture, you can take 10 minutes in the field instead of what normally would have taken me two hours uh, to document, write all my information up, go back to the office and take several more hours to write a report. Now I can capture everything on site go back, look at all the imagery, write that information up, extract all of those asset tags from the things that I found right or wrong based on the code, extract that information into Excel or some other type of text format to bring it into Word, or it could even be parsed into other inspection-based software. Kelly, next slide, please. But now we gotta go to the next step up. <clears throat> and the next step up are those LIDAR capabilities, right? And what you're looking at is a side by side, but this time, as Kelly had demonstrated previously, this side by side is imagery of what was captured with a LIDAR scanner, a terrestrial scanner that was in the previous slide, in addition to a BIM model that was developed from that LIDAR capability. And what I'm demonstrating is the ease of use of how you can manipulate this software. This is all cloud-based. 
the ease of use of how you can work through these environments and capture this. Why do we have surveyors on our team? Because everything we do is geospatially referenced. So it's real. The longitudinal, the latitude, the vertical elevation above sea level is all real. And that's the same way that we model. So it's easy to put this information side by side. And in the lower left-hand corner, you see what is called the scan bubble or where the actual scanner was relative to that location in the view. The orange line that you see there was me jumping from scan location to scan location to scan location, walking through the site. And you see that there's a stitching because we have a full campus of this electrical power substation. We have a full campus and real time three dimensional model. The point clouds are the LIDAR data, light imaging and ranging. So we can actually measure to this. And we can use that information to build the 3D model that you see on the right side. So it's not just visualization. It's also real-time capture where we can get tolerances down to a 16th of an inch. That makes us more accurate with regard to our modeling. And Russ is going to speak to this in our life cycles of these buildings. But when we turn over that actual BIM model, what we're capable of doing with that is have high, high levels of accuracy. It also gives the owner the ability to really understand the equipment that they have in a virtual environment. And in this side-by-side -side world, not only can they see it, but with the BIM model itself, they can actually manipulate it, manage it, use it for construction documentation, asset management, life cycle costing, operations, and even simulate safety simulations. And that's something that our team provides for our company as well for very, you know, uh, dangerous projects like bridge inspections and other things. Kelly, next slide. This right slide, Michael, on the bridges? Yes. So when we're talking about bridges, the image that you see here, this is 100% LIDAR. This is raw. This is what it looks like once it's processed out of the device. The bridge you're looking at is in Boston. It's over 60 years old, but it's a movable bridge, which means it spins on a turntable out in the harbor. The problem is it became deficient structurally. They didn't know what to do with it. And it's, it's fixed into a position where they wanted to know, was it worth restoration, preservation activities? Again, we have preservationists on our team, study, analyze that. But it also gave us a deeper dive and a deeper look into this bridge. Just to describe to everyone on the phone from an inspection standpoint, the bridge could only handle by structural calculation in its current state, approximately 100 pounds per square foot. That wasn't gonna cut it for safe inspections, okay? We were able to use the LIDAR reality capture from adjacent properties, bridges, tops of buildings, and because of the scan capabilities and the power of the tool with that ranging, we were able to stitch together a full three-dimensional model and provide it to the client, but also have a real-time capture of the conditions that could be zoomed in and analyzed for structural integrity and stress. Next slide. You're good. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, it's there. I think your bandwidth's lacking a little bit, but you're on the next slide with the, the piping in the water treatment. Okay, so if everybody can uh, is able to visualize the, the, the next slide, what you're looking at is um, operational inspection of a water treatment facility. And again, these are very, very high resolution. This, this required a lot of precision and a lot of accuracy. And there's a lot of metal in this environment. So we had to upgrade to our highest level scanner. And again, what you are looking at are the images and the point cloud information that came from that scan capability and technology. And what you have in that type of environment, again, is a highly accurate real-time model, very in intricate parts, pipe sizes down to a 16th of an inch going all the way up to eight foot in diameter. The motors, the pumps, the electrical wiring, conduit, Anything that was in the facility was able to be captured and that information was able to be turned over for asset lifecycle management. But we also created a BIM model of that same environment 
so that as they made repairs, operations, had to do logistics to remove components or other parts, they were able to analyze and study that inside of the BIM model. So next slide. And there, yeah, things are loading a bit slow on my side. So you guys will have to forgive me. Uh, the weather just turned south here where I'm located. Okay, so the next down. slide. Yeah, thanks for the cues, Kelly. Uh, the next slide that everyone is seeing there is one of our traditional applications for highway and transportation. So we have two different types of things that uh, this type of technology is utilized for. Pavement and gratings and location of the actual asphalt surfaces, berms, embankments, abutments, other things where the roadways align with bridges and how the bridges are actually constructed. The other thing that we do with this technology is analyze the existing structures that are there to be replaced and model the overhead wires, the existing vegetation, um, anything that is built in that environment to better inform our design teams for the replacement of those bridges and structures. And the image that you see where you see the purple lines everywhere, that is an overlay mesh model of the actual terrain that is laid on top of, again, geospatially accurate to the point clouds of the field condition of the roadway as it sits. The images on the right are of bridge from below. And what you're looking at are elevational differences, which the items can determine, or the actual, what's basically the photogrammetry of the point cloud itself, what the camera is actually capturing in an RGB format without the use of the photographs or the images. So again, these are very high resolution, very accurate, very precise tools and every once in a while, we'll go out and we'll supplement this with traditional total station um, surveying. But all of the things that I've shown you are reviewed by our professional licensed surveyors to make sure that they're accurate, that they're direct, and the data and the information is on point and specific to what it needs to be. Next slide. So here's a big example of a facility, a very large facility. Kelly talked about buildings over a million square feet. We're talking this building was close to 3 million square feet with all the pieces, parts, and components put together. Very, very large, multi-story facility, high bay in some areas. What you see on the image in the upper left is the compilation of hundreds and hundreds of LIDAR scans taken over a period of time, all meshed together in post-processing software. And then our team took that information and built a multitude of very robust, geospatially linked BIM files. Now, the reason why this is important is when we start to get into this type of data capture and collection, it's not something you can keep on a local computer. And based on your security restrictions or concerns, probably not something that you can have out in the cloud, but more than likely it's maybe too big for your server. Part of what our team does is also work with that data capture and data management to find the best solution based on security, access to design team, access to the owner, access possibly for visualization to the general public. Next slide. Yeah. Here's an example of where we start to get into those very large unmanned systems, okay, drones. And these are flyovers of various types of facilities. Again, a very large scale water treatment plant that was complemented by terrestrial LIDAR, but also drone flyover to capture all the elements vertically. All of that by our license and, 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 and uh, our licensed surveyors, and then our digital production team stitched all of that information together into one very large model. The subsequent models that came from there, again, were broken out to hundreds of different types of models. The facility you see in the lower right is a very large governmental complex we needed to capture a multitude of buildings where the first one was built in 1910. The final addition was done in the 1970s. They needed to expand and add more to that facility. So it was very important for us to not just capture what was at the ground, but the adjacent properties, but also the rooftops and the full extent of this entire facility as it sat, because it was very key to get these new components into the existing structure and facility. All of this information helps with pre-construction planning. It helps make documents more accurate. It helps check all of this information whenever it's submitted for permitting. 
code review and analysis. And for those departments or agencies that have the ability to take BIM or this type of information, it can also be used to supplement the permitting and inspection process. Because when we're done with this, we have a very, very accurate as built for complexes this large that can be turned over to the authority having jurisdiction where they're not working off of construction documents that were for planning, but something that is actually real that can be archived for record, used for life safety, used by the fire department, used for emergency responders, things of that nature. Next slide. This is an example of the highest level of where you go. Typically counties or state agencies or governmental agencies will use manned reality capture, right? The manned LIDAR, the manned photogrammetry from above. This is an example of one of those instances for power transmission lines that expand over one mile over very, very vast terrain where there's elevation differences of up to 1800 feet. There's a lot of vegetation. This is gonna be supplemented with groundwork to actually capture the sag in the wires, which can then be interpolated back to the wind conditions and the heat on the day so that an accurate, fully simulatable uh, BIM model can be delivered and derived from the project. And again, it's better for safety and it scales through all of the level of projects. So it gives us the ability to provide full information for permitting and construction inspection and documentation. And finally, we go into large facilities and this is where I'm gonna hand it over to Russ. The great thing about what you're looking at on the screen is this is Tampa Bay Lightning Stadium. Uh, and congrats to those guys, if anybody's a Tampa fan for just winning the Stanley Cup. Um, but what you're looking at in the smaller images on the two large images that you see are scan locations. And you see that in, in the upper one, there's just a ton of information there. Uh, these were hundreds and hundreds of scans to scan the entire facility. Again, this is great for construction, asset life cycle management, but also that life safety aspect that I was talking about. When you have a facility that can hold upwards of 30,000 or more people, it's very important for life safety, code enforcement, uh, periodic inspections for fire safety, fire control, um, but also evacuation procedures, emergency response procedures, things of that nature. The reality capture that we were able to stitch together on this project provided a full digital twin of that actual stadium. And that's gonna be my handoff to Russ, which will talk about the full large scale life cycle of everything there is. And that's just an example of our team at work, practicing construction safety here in Manhattan, where I'm at right now. We uh, took that image while we were doing some field work on the 61st floor of a high rise building which we've been scanning floor by floor to build and put together this entire new complex. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Michael. You, yeah. Go ahead, Russ. Uh, thanks, Kelly. Russ Dalton here, America's BIM director. I uh, come to you with about 35 years of experience uh, utilizing technology into uh, workflows. And I'm gonna cover a lot of those things with you now. Next slide. Basically, we're gonna talk about how these visualization tools are utilized during each phase of design and construction. And the value set here that we've come to know and realize is not just in, in staying ahead of the schedule and having the right data, but also at the end of the run when we're fighting claims after operations and turnover and how we're handling those things for, for the client after the project is done. And obviously uh, rework contingencies and whatnot. So we're gonna cover those. First step is uh, let's talk about the differences of a, of a project. When you start at the left here, I uh, use this graphic to talk about the five stages and basically an integrated project delivery, but starts at program development on the left, design collaboration through to CDs and turnover, and then we go to the construction and prefab, and then the last stage is owner operate. As you look across that those stages, you see visualization integration in all phases. Let me give you an example. Uh, when we, I did some uh, projects in Chicago, and if you've ever worked in downtown Chicago, you realize there's a strong network of tunnels 
that was there for building services and trash delivery, all sorts of things back at the turn of the century that you had to, you would run into. Another example is the, if you are any tennis fans in the room, the U S open in, um, in Queens, New York, where the Arthur Ashe stadium is, we built two additional stadiums there and that particular job site. It wasn't that it was just a greenfield site, but it's what you couldn't see because that particular location had two different world's fairs, 1910, I believe, and 1964. And as we uh, began to begin construction on that, we went ahead and took the architects and the, uh, the, the models, and then we did some subsurface collection, and we found out we were hitting just hundreds of different other items down there, concrete footings and foundations from decades past. So we had to do some adjustments. And the reason I bring it up is certainly we need to understand that uh, things are resolved much less expensively in the virtual world on screen than it is in the physical world. So not only does time and schedule become an issue, but it is the cost as well. And things don't cost very much on a computer screen, as you know. Um, when I think about the three things that we, we've driven our practice to, and that is geometric certainty, cost certainty, and operational certainty. And I'm going to cover those uh, through the next little bit. The biggest example I have of a digital twin is a Mobius strip, and I use that example uh, a lot. And if you're familiar with a Mobius strip, you take a strip of paper, you cut it uh, on one end, and then you twist it, and you and you tape it back together. And if you were to pull that strip between your fingers and draw on it, you'll notice at some point that the, in your mind, you're only drawn on one edge of the paper, but the beginning of the uh, line that you started from became the connection point for the end of the line. And as you look at that, you've drawn on both sides of the paper. So that continuum means that everything in the virtual world in the visualization world is an exact digital twin of the physical world. And that gets us to uh, a better better place. Certainly we know the numbers that for every dollar spent in design and construction, there are $8 spent in operations. So much less to maintain and operate that facility through predictive results on a computer screen than it is in the physical. Um, Example of that, here's the uh, a project that I was in charge of with, uh, with the BIM. And this is example of a digital twin. As you move your eyes from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen, you'll see that you go from physical all the way through a mesh of the virtual world and they're one in the same. And as we go to the virtual world, you can certainly turn off that precast bowl and go into the actual things behind it. So one of the other areas that we did, and this is the only plug I'll use uh, for, for AECOM, it's, it's a great plug, but uh, stadiums typically last about 25 to 28 years. And we recently renovated a stadium that we built in 1980. And the structural engineers came back and said, this project has such great bones, don't tear it down, let's renovate it. So this is a hard rock stadium or the home of the Miami Dolphins. And basically we had to the bones were so good, all we needed to do is remove the upper bowl of the stadium. And certainly we redid the lower bowl as well, but we replaced the upper bowl. So we needed to have geometric certainty of uh, those rakers that were there in slab verification. So we took digital uh, scans of that area and uh, not only in, in pre, but uh, post and uh, a demolition. And then we were able to order those precast bows in a world where you typically install three to four a week, we were installing nine to 11 a week. There were no shaving, no shims, no nothing of the bowl. They just went right in. And we had, once again, we had geometric certainty. Now, as we move to the other areas, which we uh, long lead time items like people movers, there's some escalators there in the top image and existing stadium. We had to verify the elevations uh, that after we moved the old escalators, we need to verify those elevations of the slabs and make sure they were spot on before they shipped the new items. I think they may have came from Spain, not sure, um, but uh, don't know that I remember, but there was an area there where they went right in, no modifications, ready to go, everything uh, fit 
Exactly. You can only imagine what kind of time savings that was to be able to drop those units in. And on the lower right, when we removed the bowl, you had to check for deflection of the structural elements. And we did a post uh, demolition effort compared to the pre. Another big example of that, if anybody's been to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, uh, I think it was built in 1910. We removed the canopies that had been there for, for decades and replaced them with new canopies, brought the building up to code, but in ADA and all those things that you, you need to do. And as we removed the upper canopies, we scanned it pre-removal and we kept the vertical supports. But as we removed it, we checked and see how much uh, movement was happening in the vertical supports, so that when we put on the new canopy, everything connected exactly right. Hey Russ, a quick question for you. You know, this is a great example of getting it done right with the conditions being perfect because they were, you know, uh, set up perfectly. What happens when it goes wrong and, you know, how this issue causes a compounding issues throughout your, your construction process? It gets pretty expensive, doesn't it? It sure does. It gets very expensive. Uh, if you've ever built a house that was out of square, it never gets trued up. It always, it just compounds itself. You cannot kick the can down the road. It's best to have good geometry. Okay. Here, here's some examples on the, uh, uh, where we tracked weekly progress of, we can go back in time to as far back as we want to go. And, and we manage this not only for geometric certainty of what's actually installed, but we also managed it uh, for cost certainty when we get into claims. And we had a claim on a project where uh, the trade contractor claimed they used a, a lot more steel than, than what they had uh, originally proposed because of the design was incorrect. Well, fortunately, as BIM director, I not only had their fabrication level model, which I could do a quick quantity takeoff on, but we also had the historic photographs that said, no, we need to get that down to uh, uh, a whole lot less than what you're claiming. And that's very important to us from a client standpoint that we manage claims uh, very effectively and legally that's so that uh, things do not get out of control. So that gave us cost certainty as well as uh, uh, geometric certainty. On a, another project in New York, we had uh, downtown Brooklyn. We built a large arena there and the DOB came back and said, you guys have destroyed the curb and gutters in this area. Fortunately, I had uh, visualization from pre-construction of the site that was able to fight that claim and save us a lot of money because those uh, damages were there long before we ever moved the first shovel of dirt. So good stuff. It's certainly a picture is worth a thousand dollars. I mean, a thousand words. I forget which way that goes. Either way, it's still a thousand. So now let's move forward and talk about reduction work. This is a project I worked on in New York. You got a, a six mile room and about 20 miles worth of baggage handling. And we tracked all of this uh, to a T on the, like we did on the right side there with visualization. You know, if you've got a solid program, when you get a design and alternates are done, shop drawings are submitted uh, from that uh, fabrication model, then all we have to do is walk the line daily, make sure that things are installed the way they, the trade said they were going to install. And if they're done correctly, then you walk away with a good set of operational as built. As you look at the image on the right, uh, the only thing that's any different is some of the railing and the diffusers not coming out uh, uh, to the side. No, they are coming out to the sides. You just see the uh, shadow on the bottom there the big diffuser on the bottom. So that's the way we get into that. And fortunately, because of the granularity of the way we do BIM is uh, uh, you have operational information as well because of that. This project, we expected the uh, construction manager executive on our project, he said, Russ, if, if, we can, if we're successful at this, it's gonna be something less than of nine to 10% rework. Obviously you've got a ton of all threads here catwalks on this conveyor system. It looks like a huge mound of spaghetti in the top left image. We witnessed less than 1% rework on this project because of our visualization, our collection, making sure that things were installed as uh, necessary and able to uh, finish the job ahead of schedule. And everybody was happy and it's still operational. So we're, we're good for that. 
Now let's talk about that's a reduced rework uh, phase. Now let's look at the schedule. Obviously, everything in, in construction is about uh, time and money, and, and uh, that piece is a schedule. We do regular uh, simulations on complicated projects, obviously, uh, for safety reasons and for permitting, uh, getting these cranes permitted where they need to be and when. This is the Mercedes Benz Stadium. If you're familiar with the uh, geometry on this curtain wall, it's a guarded falcon wing. The way a falcon guards its nest um, is the shape of that curtain wall. So it's very complex. Not only did we manage the curtain or the crane placements on this, but we pull planned based on the schedule install. And we were able to do drone flyovers and check for embeds. The drone data was obviously a geo reference to the control survey, so everything lined up. So we overlaid our laser data on the model and verified that when that piece of curtain wall came on that particular day, all the connections were good and true. And that saved us an, an absolutely enormous amount of time. It's interesting, Russ, because I was in a security presentation with uh, the, the security director from this particular stadium a few years back, and this model was used by the Secret Service and FBI uh, for a pre-planning exercise before the Super Bowl. So it's really interesting how the investment in visualization can really have many different applications, even past, past the commissioning of the building. Digital twin, isn't it, Kelly? That's Digital right. twin. That's right. And so, you know, fortunately, we're a company that gets work on a lot of very interesting projects. If you can, the, hopefully you recognize the image on the upper left there. That's the, the Sphere project there in Las Vegas. And if you're fortunate enough in this world to work on a project that changes the skyline of a city, I consider it a great privilege. And I could spend all day talking about that project. But you're looking at a 17,000 plus seat bowl there in only half of the building. The image on the lower right is Barclays Arena in New York. The whole arena all the way around is only 15,000. So just a huge project, complex architecture, and being able to drive the success of complex architecture in a world where the upper right project, which is the Marlins Ballpark, that is a design that's a riptide. As you go from the top of the stadium all the way down to the lower levels, the glass gets darker because the ocean gets darker. And so our concrete uh, uh, contractor on this complaint, they were behind schedule, had some bad safety and whatnot. And they basically said, Russ, there's not a square corner in this building. And so using the tools that visualization allows you to do so you can adapt as changes could have been made is very important on projects with complex architecture like the Case Western project on the lower left in Cleveland. Just wonderful projects that I'm glad to be part of. The project in the lower right, because of our digital practice, uh, unheard of, we only had five changes in the field. Everything was worked out. And that came straight from the CEM on the project. Russ, we only had five changes in the field that we had to deal with. And so it was very much a success. Now data is only as important as it can be harvested and utilized. And so what we've done, we utilize the dashboard process that we wrote and we harvest this data on demand. So all of our uh, executives in the company have total transparency to our jobs. This can be extended to code officials as we move forward. You know, the pandemic changed a lot about how we do things, especially in the construction world, where I can do all punch list operations through visualization from the office and reduce my travel time and, and whatnot. So we make these uh, available to our, to our stakeholders on a project team, things at the upper right there. We reach into P6 on demand, pull that data every time it's available, publish that information in a dashboard. Bottom there in the center, RFIs, submittals, any issues. Um, next slide, please, Kelly. Things like uh, startup and commissioning of equipment. How fast are we getting that done? Have I collected all of my data so for operations can be done? And certainly on the lower right there is our curtain wall analysis. We've, uh, with complex curtain walls, it makes a big difference on how those big lead time items are done and, and we track that accordingly. This is a hotel project that I showed you in Nashville and we can reach in through the dashboards 
It's integrated into BIM 360, which we use very heavily. We have project-wise as well. And we reach into the visualization capturing as we need it. These are being done by an executive on an airplane, on the mobile phone, iPad, mobile device. In a world where 10 years ago, we were getting six T1 lines to a job site and file servers. Everything is cloud-based architecture, invitation only in a secure environment. And it's just changed the way we, we operate. So certainly secure and in a world where knowledge is power, it's made a big difference to us. So what stages can we see the savings? Obviously project pre-planning, grabbing that, those things you cannot see, reducing data silos, everything's in the cloud. No more infrastructure to manage that. The time, scheduling, RFP certainly reduced. We uh, reduced RFPs. We are trying to diligently make sure we're a zero change order company because change orders do not make anybody any money. It takes a, an architect or an engineer on an average of $1,749 uh, per change order to process. And it takes a construction manager from manager from 2,900 to 5,600 per change order. You don't make money on these. Why not get it right in the visual, in the virtual world, visually, and then let's build it to spec out there with Digital Twin. Uh, 